From the outside, he was the epitome of law and order, a trusted protector of the people. But beneath the badge lay a sinister truth. That badge was the mask of a monster. Gerard John Schaefer, a Florida police officer, was the embodiment of law and order, trusted by the community to keep them safe. But little did people know that this trusted public servant was leading a sinister double life. After a string of bizarre and gruesome murders, the community found that the cop sworn to protect the people from was, in fact, the very predator. This video is the untold story of a cop turned killer and the ultimate test of justice in a broken system. Join us as we delve into the mind of a madman and uncover the twisted tale of Gerard Schaefer. Gerard John Schaefer Jr. was born on June 25, 1946, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. He was the only child of a police officer, Gerard John Schaefer Sr., and a homemaker, Gladys Edith Schaefer. Growing up, Schaefer was described as an intelligent and well-behaved child, but he also had a fascination with sadism and death. Schaefer attended Catholic school, where he was known for his strange behavior and violent tendencies. He was frequently in trouble with the law and had several run-ins with the police, including charges of assault and battery. Despite this, he went on to earn a Bachelor of Arts degree in English from Florida Atlantic University. After graduation, Schaefer worked as an English teacher, but his violent tendencies led to his eventual firing. He then worked as a police officer, following in his father's footsteps, but was fired from that job as well due to excessive use of force and misconduct. Later, he joined Martin County Sheriff's Department as a deputy. On July 22, 1972, two hysterical young women flagged down a police patrol in Martin County, Florida. The two women were in fear for their lives, with their hands cuffed behind their backs and cloth gags around their necks. They proceed to tell an almost unbelievable tale. Deputy Gerard Schaefer had pulled his gun on them earlier, cuffed the two girls, gagged them, and forcibly took them to a mangrove tree. He tied nooses around the young women's necks and hoisted the ropes on the branch of the large tree. There, Chafer tortured and raped them. He left the girls saying he would be back to finish the job when he was called away by a police dispatcher. The girls followed after freeing themselves from the nooses to tell this traumatic tale. Martin County Sheriff Robert Crowder told Schaefer to come to the police station, fired him from the job, and got him arrested. Chowder charged him with false imprisonment and two counts of aggravated assault. Schaefer received a plea deal. In exchange for pleading guilty to one count of aggravated assault, he would get a sentence of only one year in jail and three years probation. Schaefer was also pulling over women for traffic violations, using the police department's computer system to obtain their personal information so he could call them to ask them out on dates. Little did Crowder know the full extent of Schaefer's crimes. Ten months later, Martin County Sheriff's deputies found badly decomposed human body parts at the same site where the two girls were abducted and assaulted. The carcass was scattered beneath a tree with their arms, still bound with rags and their bones with multiple knife marks. The autopsies determined their bodies were hacked to pieces, then buried in a shallow grave which animals had subsequently dug up and scavenged. The dental records identified them as two girls who had gone missing from Neft. Lauderdale in September of the previous year, while Schaefer was still out on bond. As the investigation into Schaefer's activities continued, a key witness named Lucille came forward with information that led the police to search not only the home he shared with his girlfriend, Teresa, but also his mother's home, where he had stored some of his belongings. At the Schaefer's home, Investigators discovered a luxurious suede purse that had been given to Teresa by Gerard. The purse was identified as one that had been given as a gift to Georgia Jessup, who had gone missing. However, it was at Schaefer's mother's house where the most damning evidence was found. Inside a steamer trunk, police discovered a collection of women's belongings, including jewelry, keepsakes, and IDs, 
belonging to 38 missing or murdered women, going back to 1966. One of these items was a locket inscribed with the name Lay, which was later identified as belonging to Lay Hainline, a former neighbor of Schaefer who had disappeared in 1969. The stash also included the IDs of 19-year-old hitchhikers Colette Goodna and Barbara Wilcox, who had last been seen just a week before Schaefer's arrest. In addition to the trunk full of keepsakes, police found hundreds of pages of Schaefer's writing. The stories, which were so detailed and realistic, were believed by the police to be thinly veiled confessions of abduction, torture, rape, murder, necrophilia, and cannibalism. The evidence against Gerard John Schaefer was overwhelming, and he was later convicted of two counts of murder and sentenced to life in prison. However, many questions remain about his involvement in other disappearances and murders, and the true extent of his crimes may never be known. Despite the overwhelming evidence pointing towards numerous victims, the authorities were only able to recover the bodies of four individuals, Sharon Place, Georgia Jessup, Mary Briscolina, and Elsie Farmer. The remains of Briscolina and Farmer, both young girls aged 14 and 13 respectively, were discovered in early 1973 and were found to have been decapitated. The discovery of their skeletons was a chilling reminder of the brutality of the crimes committed by Gerard John Schaefer. After investigations, Schaefer's troubled childhood came to the fore. He was a son of an abusive and alcoholic father. Schaefer often wished he'd been born a girl because his father did not beat his sisters. He had an obsession with women's undergarments since a young age. Schaefer stole them and wore them to get sexually aroused. He also had the habit of peeping into their windows. His odd behaviors escalated to violence. He killed animals he found in the woods. He later admitted to beheading cows and having sex with the carcasses. He had a deeply disturbing habit of going to the woods in the stolen underwear, tying himself to a tree with a noose, and hurting himself while masturbating. In October of 1973, Gerard Schaefer, former Martin County Sheriff's deputy, stood trial for the murders of Nancy Trotter and Paula Wells. After a court trial, he was found guilty on two counts of first-degree murder and was given two life sentences to be served concurrently. Schaeffer continuously appealed his case but was rejected each time. While serving his sentence, Schaeffer acted as a self-titled jailhouse lawyer, gathering information from his fellow inmates and turning it over to the police. He also wrote graphically violent stories and would read them aloud to the other prisoners, with the exception of his close friend, infamous serial killer Ted Bundy. Investigations into Schaefer's other possible murders began to surface as police linked him to multiple missing women and girls. However, without enough evidence, he was never charged. Sandra London, Schaefer's former girlfriend and crime writer, reached out to him in 1990 and helped him publish two volumes of his writings and drawings, Killer Fiction and Beyond Killer Fiction. Despite publicly denying any involvement in the crimes, in his letters to London, he boasted about killing between 80 to 110 women and girls. London shared these letters with the police, leading to reopened investigations into the disappearances of Carmen Halleck, Leigh Hainline, and Belinda Hutchins, all of whom had ties to Schaefer. When London confronted him about his confessions, he threatened her life, leading her to cut off all contact. Just before police scheduled an interview with Schaefer in December of 1995, he was murdered by fellow inmate Vincent Rivera in a dispute over hot water. His death left a legacy of unanswered questions and families without closure. Though his death was mourned by his family, many in the law enforcement community viewed it as a sense of relief as they no longer had to deal with the threat of lawsuits. One officer even described him as having halitosis of the soul. However, his death also meant that the truth about the disappearance of dozens of women and girls may never be known. When Gerard Schaefer left this world, he took with him the knowledge of where they may be and the possibility of their ever being brought home again.